This is a Security Weekly production. Here's your host. He's a new few no ops short of an exploit, socially engineers the elderly, and is known as the Kill Bit at Parties. Paul Asadorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Very excited to be here this evening. We are in the studios, and to my right is Allison Nixon. Welcome, Allison, to the show. Hi, everyone. Allison has our tech segment for this evening on regular expressions. Those are expressions that take the appropriate amounts of Metamucil to keep them. They are highly regular, regular. and they are far better than irregular expressions. Uh, irregular expressions. Also, That'll I be have next so week. So many computers right now. <laughs> it's awesome. Speaking of keeping regular, Mr. Jack Daniels here in the house. <laughs> <laughs> ah, indeed, indeed. Uh, becomes uh, difficult. Your, that's why you're so cranky and curmudgeon isn't it? Yeah, it's, that's <laughs> it. No, that's, a related uh, commentary. How do people lose weight and give up coffee at the same time? I mean, how would you stay... Never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jack's here in studio. On the lines via Skype, Mr. Joff Thayer is here with us. Welcome, Joff, to the show. Uh, good evening there, Paul and co. Good to be here. Good day, mate. Um, G'day, how are you? Is, is anyone else on via Skype? Did we add Carlos, maybe? No, we didn't do that. Okay, uh, we're, n- we're new at this. What? Is, is he really complaining? He sounds like my six-year-old for crying out loud. <laughs> um, so this is actually, despite what the show notes say, episode 364, and it is March 6th. I want to remind everyone... <laughs> that. Hello. Oh, hey. Hola, Carlos. How are you? Good day. Um, welcome to the show. We're just getting started here. Thanks for uh, for joining us. Okay. Let me connect. Yeah, uh, if you want to just... Mic- there's a little bit of background. If you want to just mute your microphone and we'll we'll take care of that maybe uh, uh, after the... Yeah, um, I'm speaking with the uh, internal mic on, on the laptop. Let me connect... Uh, the big microphone. Okay, yeah, there's just like a, a clicking noise too. I don't know if that's because you're, you're connecting your headset or. Yep. If you're, are you are you cocking your Glock? Is your Glock ready to pop? pop, pop? <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't have it on me today. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I want to remind everyone: Offensive Countermeasures Hack Lab will be at the Mid Atlantic CCDC Conference 2014. That's the last week in March, and we'll be sticking around to MC the event. You can go to maccdc.org. To find out more information, uh, Jack Daniel will be at Security B Sides Orlando from April 5th through the 6th. It is a community driven event seeking to bring together Central Florida InfoSec with a passion for making, breaking, and protecting. Jack will be there. April 5th, I will be speaking at Harvard University at the Northeast Linux Fest, which has nothing to do with Harvard other than that that's where the event is. And I will be there on April, Saturday, April 5th. Uh, let's see, next week, I will be at the Sands uh, ICS SCADA Summit, so check me out there. I'll have some of the new Hack Naked t-shirts. No, we don't sell Hack Naked t-shirts online yet. Maybe someday, but for now, you have to find us at a conference. Uh, I'm also excited <laughs> to speak at the Charlotte ISA Conference and the NOLA Conference in New Orleans in June. Uh, you can find more information about all the conferences we'll be at in the show notes. Uh, Also, if you want to sponsor a webcast, contact me, paul at securityweekly.com. There's lots of open slots for webcasts. Uh, And uh, coming up in April, we're going to welcome our new sponsor, Silent Break Security. So make sure you stay tuned for that as well. On to our guest interview for this episode. We have on with us tonight, Eve Adams, a senior talent acquisition expert. At Hay- Haylock or Halock? Haylock. Haylock. Haylock Security Labs, a full service information security advisory in Schamburg, Illinois. Schamburg. Schamburg, <laughs> Illinois. Eve, welcome to the show. It's nice to have Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Co. Thanks for having me on. Um, so, Eve, um, there's a lot more about you in the show notes that people can read, but uh, of course, I prefer they listen or watch the interview. Uh, to find out more about you. So I, I want to know, how do you get involved into uh, recruiting? Uh, so pretty long story. Um, after college, like many of us, I kind of drifted because I found the idea of gainful employment distasteful at best. 
and uh, eventually I, I did a, li- a lot of a lot. I did some consulting. I was at one point the world's worst sysadmin and a uh, friend of mine, actually a network engineer I had worked with uh, who had gotten into recruiting because she was a mom and it's hard to be a mom configuring firewalls at three o'clock in the morning, uh, said to me, hey, I'm doing IT recruiting now. It's actually kind of cool. Uh, come on board. But this was uh, at an agency, which, as we all know, uh, there's like literally no barrier to entry for agency recruiters. And it was just dumb luck that I got into it. But uh, that was about three years ago. So much happier now that I'm not at a big boiler room agency. Yeah. Um, So how did you get involved with the security community and recruiting? Now, do you uh, recruit specifically for the computer security, information security industry? Yes, uh, exclusively within InfoSec. So uh, that network engineer, we were mostly working at the time when I was at that big, uh, weird agency. We were mostly working on network engineering jobs. And uh, this was for a major telecom, which I won't name, but their logo looks like the Death Star. And if you know this company, uh, you're probably aware that they really have trouble attracting security talent. And I liked security, so I kind of volunteered to uh, to take that bullet and to work on the security jobs. Uh, so that was mostly network security, uh, threat groups within data centers, uh, things of that nature. A little bit other stuff, a little bit of PCI stuff, but not not really so much on the compliance side. And I kind of developed a network and uh, over the years between a couple more big lame agencies uh, just started specializing in security. And that's why I think Haylock wanted to hire me because I have those contacts. So yeah, uh, Haylock's a security company. I recruit for internal and third party roles. Hmm. So what advice do you have for those that maybe are just getting their start in their information security careers? So uh, I'm giving a talk on this subject that I uh, will be called Attack Paths. I have it submitted to a few B-sides, and uh, it will be, I know for sure, at B-sides Nashville. Uh, It's something I hear a lot, not just from, say, fresh grads, people fresh out of college, but maybe IT people who have an established career, and they're like, "Uh, yeah, I like security stuff. Um, I want to get into it. And what I say is you can undervalue self-study and learning on your own. You know, the first question I ask people is, do you have a lab at home? Okay, what do you do with it? Are you, you know, doing intentionally vulnerable sites? Are you doing anything like John McRae or Georgia Weidman's training? Have you looked into those? What are you reading? What types of online classes are you taking? And that's the type of stuff I really like to see on a resume because not only does it show initiative, but it shows the mentality of a true security hobbyist, somebody who's passionate about this stuff, will do this stuff when they're not getting paid. And you also, know, you know, Eva, the quality I, of that training is, it's uh, really is funny. something I look at too. It's really funny that you say that because when I went on my uh, <clears throat> one of the interviews early on in my career, uh, they asked me if I had any experience with NFS. And I said, yeah, I run that at home. And they're right. like, what do you mean you run that at home? I'm like, oh, I brought a picture of my home security lab. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's excellent. That's something that I would, you know, maybe not bringing a picture, although that's pretty cool, but be prepared to talk about it. Yeah, be I don't know. I think that yeah. could go either way, bringing a picture. I'm not sure <laughs> how you feel about that. <laughs> that, but... that might not be the best job sack for yourself. It worked out for me. I got the job, but <laughs> right. <laughs> might right. not work for all situations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So that's a big thing. Certainly networking is something that I can't emphasize enough. Uh, You know, not just uh, looking for uh, people who might be hiring managers or recruiters. Go beyond that. Certainly go to events. Uh, B-sides, I can't recommend highly enough uh, for networking for people who want to get into the field. Local meetups, whether that be your D.C. chapter, uh, I certainly have to give a shout out to Burbsack here in the Chicagoland area. Uh, Wait, that's not just about bourbon? No, it is not just about bourbon. In fact, I mean, there's not, believe it or not, there's not a ton of bourbon drinkers at uh, at Burb Sex. It's mostly about beer. Hmm. But uh, I know a colleague of mine likes old fashions. So oh, that, that loves old something. fashions. Yeah. I have a little bit Gotta of addiction have. to old fashions. I love you too. Oh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they have to have the orange. Oh, yeah. Right? Orange, bitters, 
uh, it's the sugar. worst when you go to a bar and you order an old fashioned and some yutz gives it to you without an orange. I oh, hate that. God. And maraschino cherries, like good maraschino cherries, not real, real, ma- yeah. real maraschinos yeah. from And a little Luxardo. bit of the juice from the maraschino right. yeah, cherries. Yeah, Lux- in Luxardo. There. It's got to yeah. say Luxardo on the bottle or it's not a real yes. maraschino. Yeah, Jack knows whereof he speaks. Jack's, I think, the undisputed authority. On, yeah. on these matters. But, and uh, every old one, fashioned Jack gives me has roofies in it too, which is kind of a nice <laughs> side effect. <laughs> it's a, just so a little bold. extra twist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, any other advice for people getting their strong information secure? So, you mentioned, uh, you know, have a lab at home, do self study, and yeah. uh, participate in, in local uh, security groups. Yeah, uh, network, get out there. And one thing I say to people is, you know, don't be shy. The security community has perhaps not entirely undeservedly a reputation for being like, ooh, scary, those guys are are mean and cliquish and standoffish. And there can be an element of that. But I, on the whole, have found, and people who are looking to enter the industry, I think have found... We're really pretty friendly people who are eager to share information. You know, we've got, in many senses, a pretty open source mentality about, you know, helping to cultivate new talent and new blood. And I think that's fantastic. So, you know, when you go to these meetups, don't be shy. Just say, hi, I'm Susie Blue. This is my background. Tell me what you can. You know, I've got a friend who's a dev who has zero security background whatsoever and he started coming to these meetups and people are just all over him like here's an OWASP tutorial you can look at oh you're in .NET what would be particularly pertinent to you stuff like that I mean people are pretty welcoming um, and, and certainly I mean those are the big ones self study read all you can mm. you know start to look at websites you know start to look at dev tools on websites in the source code and say oh what do I recognize here that's scary you know, it, the, the opportunities for learning are pretty much everywhere you look. Now, Eve, what about uh, certifications? I'm sure ah. you must get asked this question a lot, right? Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, how, how much value do you put in certifications and how much effort do you recommend people put into certifications? And, and maybe just start with when you're first starting out in your career, right? Sure. Um, yeah, people ask me all the time, you know, what cert should I get? Mm. And I find that kind of frustrating uh, for even further, you know, if I get a CEH, will that make me a good hacker? <laughs> yes. Like, no. no. That's a totally different question than what certification should I get, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, you know, what would make you a good hacker is if you sit your ass down in your lab and hack things and Ooh. rinse and repeat for years and years and years and many long, lonely, lonely nights in your lab. But anyway... Um, so certs, I mean, they don't hurt. You know, I'm never going to turn up my nose at somebody because they have a CISSP or a GIAC or whatever whatever cert you want to throw out there. You know, It may show a certain level of dedication, like, oh, I paid a couple grand to do this course and to get this cert. But alone, they are 99% of the time practically worthless. If you don't have that experience and look I mean I am not the type of person who's going to say oh you don't have three to five years of experience with X technology therefore no job for you I've hired kids straight out of college with no work experience for pretty nice jobs but that was because they had put the time in Uh, the one cert I will say will certainly it won't make me automatically hire a person but will certainly pique my interest is the OSCP because that is an experiential cert that is pretty hard to get and does actually demonstrate some hacking ability. Mm -hmm. Um, There are other ones I like. Uh, CEH and CISSP get bashed a lot. Uh, I do like the GIAC certs a lot, but in terms of importance, I think their importance is really overblown. Mm -hmm. Um, It sounds to me like you you want a candidate, and I I agree with this, to be well-rounded, right? If someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, I'm involved in my local security group. I've got a lab at home and I hack around and I created a blog to talk about what I'm discovering in my lab. And I went off and I got a certification in security. It doesn't even matter which one, right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I did an internship with XYZ company for a while. That would be an ideal candidate for you, right? Just getting their start, doing all exactly. those things. Yeah. Exactly. And when people come to me and they say, hey, I've got 
whatever cert can I have a job now I say no because you clearly are looking for some kind of silver bullet fast yeah, track way to yeah. get a job and it doesn't right. demonstrate any actual real interest in security now do you think that the value of cert- a certification kind of diminishes as your career progresses uh, so it depends I mean can you give me an, ex- an example because I've had people who are like yeah I got a CCIE security 10 years ago but uh, I don't know if it's relevant anymore or yeah. I kind of look at certifications in a general sense and this isn't always mm. the case right they kind of help get your foot in the door right they're one of those kind of feathers in your cap when you're trying to get a job and then after you've worked for three or five years you know you're going out and getting other certifications I think maybe my opinion is the reason you would do that is maybe you want to go into a different area of expertise within security, you want to get that certification. That's almost like still trying to get your foot in the door, right? Yeah, so if, for instance, I'm coming back to the OSCP, um, so say you're a firewall jockey Mm -hmm. and you know a lot about infrastructural security and now all of a sudden you want to be a pen tester. Mm -hmm. Again, the cert will help, but it's not, the cert is not going to get you the job. The experience you gain while getting the cert might help you get the job. You're still gonna, for my company, you're still gonna have to hack our lab. Uh, But in terms of diminishing value as you progress in your career, I think it's more that your experience and projects you've worked on, initiatives, any leadership experience, any thought leadership experience, that becomes more valuable and starts kind of fade into the periphery. I wanna, just jump in yeah, for a couple. Of, yeah. One thing that you said in passing there is, if uh, if the boss makes you get a you know fill in the blank cert, CISSP is a good example because it's maligned and often for good reasons. Even though <laughs> even though we have friends there trying to make a difference, um, you can either uh, get the cert and move on, or you can actually like stop and use the Googles and learn some shit while you're at it because it's so broad that there will be things you've never heard of and never cared about and some of it's dumb but you can actually use these as a learning experience and i think that's a huge difference but i also have a uh, a fantasy that isc squared will introduce a new cert since they're introducing all of these crazy ones they have no business doing and i want them to introduce a certified information security recruiting professional so that when people pitch me blindly from linkedin or anywhere else or call me on the phone because they Google me, I can tell them they're not qualified to hire security professionals because they don't have a CISSRP and then hang up on them. (laughs) And that might go further to break the back of the CISSP than anything that ISC Squared can do. Jack, I applaud that idea. And if anyone at ISC Squared is listening, I would be delighted to consult with you on the formation of such a cert. However, my 1099 rate is $5,000 an hour. <laughs> uh, Worth so, every penny. So, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, Paul, could I jump in with a question? Please do, Jeff. Uh, so, um, Eve, uh, I'm, I'm curious because I made this transition myself as – as to how you advise the the kind of the mid career IT professional who's coming from let's say a long systems administrator career or perhaps a a, a long um, you know network administrator career and they're really interested in going in the security direction because that's where the cool stuff is um, you know of course I'm showing my bias there but uh, you know it seems like so far you've talked about the the early entrant kind of person but but what do you what do you do with the, the mid career folks. Sure, and I do plan to address this in my upcoming talks, uh, shameless self-promotion on those. But um, So in the exact same way you acquired your SA skills or your network engineering skills, you know, when you're like a cub desktop support person or you're a help desk guy and you would actually talk to, you know, the big intimidating network engineers like, oh, you're installing a core router. Can I watch you do that? Can I help you do that? In the same way, you know, you got to be open to learning anything you can about security on the job. So, oh, okay, it might not be the most interesting thing to you personally. For instance, you hear that your organization is going through a PCI audit. Oh, God forbid, you know, we all say, oh, boring, stupid. But you ride along on that. You say, hey, I'm interested in learning more about that. And then you can, in your next job interview, say, hey, I've been involved in PCI audits. If they're doing a firewall refresh, you ask if you can be involved in that. And sometimes for security reasons, you won't be allowed to be. But 
become a pest about learning everything on the job that you can while you're doing that self-study, just as you would if you were a fresh entrant into the field. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> and I have a, a question kind of common. How do you feel about um, what I call the technology religions? I've been doing a lot of interviews recently since I'm hiring several people for my team. Sure. And many times when people come into the interview, I start telling them, well, for the position, we need you to know several operating systems, uh, several scripting languages. And I've had, had cases when people go, oh, I'm a Windows guy, oh, I'm a Linux guy, or I'm a Python guy, or I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't do Ruby, and in each, immediately I just discard them. I go like, sure. leave technical religion outside. Uh, outside. Uh, you should be able to kind of adjust to any environment, know the basics, be willing to learn, be willing to jump in. How do you feel about that? And the other one is many times, why do people don't put their GitHub or their Bitbucket in their Thank resumes? You. They should Thank put that. You. That's one of the first yeah, things that's, um, that we get in back and forth. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Get one. Talking over you. Oh, no problem. Oh. Um, so, yeah, uh, starting with your last question, I absolutely advise people to put their uh, their GitHub or their Bitbucket or even, you know, links to blog articles or links to exploits they've published or you know, anything like that, anything that demonstrates things that you've actually done. But yeah, I, w I want to see your repo. I want to see your code. That would be fantastic. Um, Is that, and, so yeah, what other tips do you have for the, the resume? I know I had a question there about what tips do you have for the resume? That's, that's obviously a great tip. Um, yeah. Is, yeah, there, that's a is it almost card. like a, are we breaking away from the traditional resume and going to something a little more dynamic? I want to get to that, but I want to answer sure, uh, the first question first. Um, so if people are, are tech partisans, and heck, I'm a tech partisan. It says right there in my bio, I'm a big Linux fangirl. I will generally prefer anything open source, and I kind of hate Microsoft. But Wait, VI or Emacs? Dude, VI. Oh, thank God. Oh, okay. I love this girl. Uh, man, <laughs> Emacs, do I look like a masochist? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, no, I mean, I think that um, that tech partisanship really bespeaks just a poor attitude more than anything else. I mean, yeah, you can be, you know, a big floss person all you want, or you can say, eh, I don't like Ruby, but you know what? What if you get into a situation where you need Ruby? And you probably will. So, you know, people who refuse to learn, that's essentially what they're saying. I refuse to Except learn. When it comes Why would to I hire Emacs. somebody who refuses to learn? When it comes to Emacs, then, you know, I've never read in a situation where I had to use Emacs. Dude, you would be surprised how many people I, I have gotten resumes when I asked them about Emacs or VI. They got an answer from reverse engineers and exploit developers that say Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. I suppose in theory there could be a situation where you had to use Emacs. I, I suppose. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on what that would be, but... Uh, well, uh, the, the way I see it is they're tools. Uh, yeah. I like the mentality where people, uh, at least for work, for what they do as a hobby, they can have a passion. My passion yeah. is writing in Ruby, Python, and PowerShell. That's my po that's my passion. I write on all three of those, and I'm always kind of tinkering around those, mainly on the Windows side and a bit on the uh, OS X side. But when it comes to work, I I really like it when people go with the attitude, "Hey, all technology is a tool. They're yeah. just a bunch of tools, and I'll pick the right one for the right job." But you know, what's well, funny that's uh, true of any position. I mean, if you are in a professional context and you refuse to do what you need to do in order to do your job and to cover your responsibilities. I mean, that, like I say, that's an attitude problem. And it's the same regardless of tools. People should be agnostic as to tools they're using. And some of those questions are, are total screening, right? Because if you yeah. ask the VI Emacs question, they go, what are you talking about? Then, right. You know, and, and the no resume point says, The, the says correct Linux. answer is obviously to FTP it to a Windows box and use <laughs> Notepad. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Paul, I'm glad you... Uh, you brought up the third possibility, which is, I don't know. Right. I don't know. It's not an example. Oh, no. My, my favorite is, you're getting hired for a reverse engineering position. And I ask, how, how much experience you have with IDA? And they t ask me, what is IDA? Oh, dear. Oh, my. Oh, yeah, that's, that's going to be a red flag. 
Um, but Paul, you asked about resumes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I cover this exhaustively in my uh, Hack the Hustle talk. The I would say one thing I'd like to see more of. The one thing I stress is verbal the nouns. Meaning, if you're talking on a resume, say about Ida, don't put Ida alongside all the other reversing tools that you use in a big wall of text at the bottom of your resume. Attach a verb to it, like use Ida for reverse engineering on such and such projects, and this is some of the malware I was working with, and you know, this is how I incorporated reading assembly into it. I feel like the wall of text of technologies really does you no good. Um, I'd rather see like a, a slideshow or something. I don't know. I think the traditional resume is kind of yeah, that's now. interesting. Um, so I have a lot of people say to me, oh, I don't need a resume. I am too famous for that. Or I don't need a resume. I have LinkedIn. Or just go look at my GitHub and you'll see how great I am. That's fine. But a resume may be nothing but a formality, but it's still a formality. It's still like wearing pants to the interview. You may not want to, right. but you still should. So you still need that text-based one page piece of paper that consists of your resume in other words you know it may not be strictly necessary for everyone but i still think it's a best practice to have one mm -hmm. just so that i mean once again if it's an hr hoop you got to jump through You're right, right. and i got no more love for hr than anybody else but uh if it's you know a formality that you have to observe just just do it don't let that get in your way yeah don't oh, step too I, I was trying to see how far outside the box i could step before you kind of said no you got to kind of have like a paper-based yeah. in, in my paper. case is i just want to see in a resume the highlights of your career what do you think is important where do you think you're good at and what are those references either be it people i can talk to communities you're a member of uh as you mentioned repos what are your repos whatever they are or code that I can reference or presentations that I can reference, but at least include the highlights. So I know I, I can get an idea of this candidate before I actually do the phone call. That's so the advantage I, of the, the rest highlight of reel would be so it. awesome to have a video with flying. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, and I would, I mean, I would appreciate that. Here's a that question though, like really quick. I'm sorry, I interrupt you. Or a video uh, Eve, or but, hell, interpretive dance, whatever. But, uh, Again, the resume is a formality that yeah. occasionally yeah, a gig you no, have, they're going to need it. That's what I wanted listeners to take away. So Yeah. I'm just sorry, just a quick follow-on question, Paul, if you don't mind. Um, Eve, uh, is there not a, a, an issue still with automated resume scanning? And, and so you, you made a comment in verbal the nouns, right? Right. Um, does that not have a have a challenge in, in kind of getting above the, the, the pile of resumes or – are we not in that boat here? So I don't know. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with how certainly agency recruiters work and how specifically their software works. But essentially, uh, you put together Boolean strings. So I will say firewall and ASA in parentheses, and then I can add a bunch of operators to it that'll make it so that your resume pops either in my database or on a job board such as Dice or Monster. Um, so the scans that you're talking about, the keyword scans, if you put used Ida Pro for reversing in your resume, Ida Pro will still pop. It doesn't yeah. necessarily need to be in a chunk of text at the bottom. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just was, yeah, I was interested in that, um, you know, almost from the perspective of maybe you should have two resumes in the pocket, one to get above yeah. the scanners and then the second one to, to actually give out. <laughs> and I, I definitely, and I always do recommend, you know, people say to me, hey, if I put everything in my resume that I've ever done in my life, my resume, resume would be 90 pages long. And that's why I say fork your resume. If you think there's a possibility that you might want to apply to several different types of positions, have your project management resume, have your pen testing resume, have your defensive AppSec resume, you know, it's a pain, but it will help you to kind of streamline that process. Good deal. Good deal. Um, so the market in uh, the job market and security is pretty competitive uh, yeah. in terms of being an employer, right? Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's lots of people to choose from. So I guess from a, uh, a you know, when you're applying for a position, it can be competitive as well. But sure. what tips do you have for employers to find the right people to fill positions? So um, this is a <laughs> this is something I deal with a lot with my clients. Uh, I 
tend to think that I have great clients that are great places to work, but whenever I'm, for instance, doing a scoping call with a new client, I say, okay, what is great about working for your company? What is great about this job? Uh, why, why would I want this job? How can I sell this job to somebody? How can I make this an attractive position for somebody? And I feel like um, a lot of companies are so focused on how bad they need security talent that they lose sight of why a security professional would want to work there. Mm. So, you know, they're thinking, oh my God, we need pen testers. Oh my God, we need a virtual CISO. Oh my God, we need secure coders. But they don't think about how they're going to attract those folks. So what I would encourage uh, all hiring managers and certainly recruiters and hiring managers who are working with recruiters to do and to keep front of mind is, um, you know, why would a security person who have 0.9% unemployment in calendar year 2012, who in many cases can write their own checks, who in most cases have very comfortable, very lucrative positions, why would they want to make a move to your company? That's the number one thing you got to think about. For us, it would be you don't have to wear pants to work, which is that is a, a definite perquisite <laughs> that I, I would certainly include in all future job descriptions. Excellent. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. So, in honor of this uh, episode, Eve, I actually did post a new uh, position or two yeah. to the website. Awesome. So we are looking for an executive producer. So excellent. Um, I would apply, but. Um, the job description seemed to entail a lot of being organized and coordinating, coordinating yeah. things. Yeah. You and know that, that is, huh? <laughs> those are not my core competencies. Interesting how we have to hire someone that is organized. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that ain't me. So, <clears throat> Eve, let's take someone that is uh, working a job, whether in security or not, right? Um, they want to get into security maybe or go to a different area of security, move up in the security field they're already working in, but they're not happy with their job, what are the top things they can do to start making a move? I think a lot of people kind of, you know, get stuck in the rut and they're like, I don't even know what to do to make the first step to changing my situation and they feel stuck. Yeah, um, so not at the risk of sounding like a broken record, networking, certainly uh, talking to people. If only in you know, if only to take the pulse of what's out there, if only to say, hey, how did you get your current job? What does your company look for? Do you know of any openings? What would you suggest I do as somebody who is where I want to go next? Um, that's major. Make sure your skills are current. Uh, and this doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out and learn all the newest hottest scripting languages or familiarize yourself with all the state of the art tools that are out there, but make sure that you bring at least something to the table that is involved in positions that you're going for. So if you think you want to be a pen tester next, then make sure you actually know something that would be valuable on a pen testing engagement. I see a lot of people saying, for instance, you know, but I know about security. I know how it's done. Well, have you ever done it? No. So then you need to go back to the self-study. Then you need to go back to sharpening up your skills and making sure they're applicable to the position you want to be in. What are, what are some of the highest paying positions in security and why? I'm just curious. Uh, um, that's an interesting question. If you want a short answer, I would say uh, the most lucrative gig on my desk right now is for uh, a managing director uh, with application security experience and mm -hmm. that's you're looking at like the 300 plus thousand uh, but I have heard of positions that pay a lot more you will often see some pretty plush gigs uh, in consulting mm -hmm. and this is generally on an hourly basis because you can charge five hundred a thousand dollars an hour depending on what you're doing um, I've seen secure coding be extremely lucrative. This would be developers with security front of mind. Uh, any consulting that is on a very specific uh, product from certain vendors where I'm sure we can all think of product vendors that charge a ludicrous amount of money for implementations, upgrades, and maintenance. Uh, 
that's a very specific skill set. So if you can demonstrate the, that you're a subject the, um, matter expert in one of those, those can be pretty plush. Who are the happiest people in our industry? Aside from, oh God, aside is from, anybody yeah. happy in our industry? <laughs> aside from Jack, of course, right? <laughs> um, I, I think that is an excellent question. I'm not sure I can answer that because I know... Uh, You know, believe it or not, I know QSAs who are pretty happy with their jobs. Um, I would say pen testers. Later on tonight's show, we'll talk about the problems of substance abuse and information security (laughs) in QSAs. Um, (laughs) uh, Pen testers are a pretty happy bunch, though, I'd find. Yeah. Well, until, uh, until I would say pen testers report. are probably the grouchiest, but that's because they, of course, have that delightful air of superiority about them that we all enjoy so much. Well, I, well know, evangelists. I think they have to write reports, you know. That too. That too. And they all love writing reports. Uh, that grouchy. <laughs> yeah. I think blue team people are pretty happy because, you know, they, they feel like the hero a lot. And that's cool. Um,. No, I honestly, yeah. I would say, you know, despite the well-known problems with uh, with depression and substance abuse and report-related grouchiness in our industry, uh, I think we're pretty happy people on the whole. I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so here's an interesting question. So from from two different perspectives, right? Um, and the value proposition is different. Whether you're the employee or the employer, how do you put the right salary number on a position? Uh, how bad is your pain? Uh, <laughs> how bad do you need? Uh, well, for, okay, so from the employer perspective, how much does it hurt? You need to look, and you do this like a risk assessment, and this is kind of the approach I like to take to it. What do you stand to lose if you don't hire this person? What, I mean, are there development projects you won't be able to go forward with? Will your uh, infrastructure or your websites remain vulnerable and potentially vulnerable to attack? What is the dollar amount of that vulnerability? How much do you stand to lose? Are there clients who will bail if you don't become compliant with something? Will you be fined if you don't comply, become compliant with a certain standard? So, you know, you look at the pain. Um, in terms of knowing what you're worth in as a candidate for a position, it's pretty easy to do some research and run comps, but it never hurts to talk to some hiring managers, talk to some recruiters and say, hey, can you give me a ballpark idea of what somebody with my skill set should expect to make? I'll be very upfront with people. I mean, I am a slave trader. I will tell people this is what somebody like you could fetch at auction straight up. Mm. Um, but yeah, do your research. Um, <clears throat> what about referrals? Do you, is there a lot of, uh, uh, you know, stock that you put into existing employees of the company making referrals? Are there going oh, rates yeah. for that? Or like, how should someone structure that kind of? Well, it's like I say, networking is of pretty paramount importance. So, you know, if I know somebody is a badass and they say this person is a badass, you should talk to him. Mm. You know, that that definitely puts a shine on the person they're referring. Um, This is a pretty close knit community. You know, I've had, believe it or not, I've had people in Belgium refer me to people in Seattle and you know everything else that you can think of so people do stay pretty close they do look out for their own and a recommendation from somebody I respect man there's there's no greater quality to have than coming recommended that's great great advice uh you also want to talk a little bit about um some tricks that recruiters play to mine your data, which we touched on a little bit. I don't know if you wanted to expand on that point. Yeah, I can. Um, So I think a lot of people underestimate uh, not necessarily the intelligence of recruiters because, uh, let's face it, a lot of recruiters really are not that bright. But uh, I, I think the level of sneakiness and the level of research that a lot of recruiters will do on a prospective candidate. So, you know, I've had candidates for positions where I Google their name and the first thing that pops up is a photo of them smoking a giant blunt. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, um, how do you nope. how do you have Google results that when you search for your name that comes up? <laughs> I it's you know especially if you have a fairly unique name. Um, mm. 
but yeah, I mean, no judgment here, but that's not necessarily the first impression you want to make. Mm. Uh, Google we do... John Stryan. I'm sorry. Yeah, don't Google another one of the John uh, co-hosts. Uh, I would yeah. say just Google his name. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Or maybe you do. I don't know. Um, but anyway. um, wow. and I would say you know we do use open source intelligence tools. Um, I don't use Multigo. Uh, I use some kind of clunkier older stuff that in my opinion works just as well but uh we do often uh use social engineering tricks so one thing that springs to mind was a recent article in valley wag and this is a trick as old as time itself uh some companies in silicon valley are deploying attractive young women to the popular bars uh near tech companies and trying to lure uh, their IT staff away uh, just by having these uh, pretty ladies chat up their programmers, developers, and general technical staff. So, you know, that's what we consider a honeypot. We, I don't do that. Uh, nobody at my current company does that, but I've seen that done at companies where I've worked in the past. Uh, also, social engineering through organizational charts. Uh, I've worked at companies that have bought organizational charts from people within the company. So you now have everybody's work phone number, hmm. all of their relationships, their title, what they do. There's some really shady, unethical stuff that goes on. So, you know, be paranoid about recruiters. Be more than paranoid about recruiters uh, because there are some dastardly tricks. I would Which, totally of course, I would never use honeypot. that. I would totally that, not fall for the honeypot. <laughs> I said I would totally fall for the honeypot. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just admitting it right out there. you know. That's good. It's good to be honest with yourself. So, uh, Eve, do you uh, maintain a blog or uh, have a place where people can go to find out, you know, maybe where you'll be speaking next? You know, I have an About Me, which is under construction, and um, I've been working to put together a website because that is a good idea uh so where i will be speaking in the very near future i will be as i said at besides nashville uh fingers crossed besides chicago which is one of my favorite events ever uh have to give props to circle city con which is coming up in indianapolis i will be doing resume training there and a workshop on interviewing uh job career strategies for security professionals uh, that's at circlecitycon.com uh, you should check it out uh, but other than that no I've been pretty lax about my web presence uh, I do blog on Haylock's website which is haylock.com uh, check that out uh, and that's H-A-L-O-C-K yep correct just in case someone wanted to try some ridiculous spelling of that <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of different ways you can spell that right it's um, true so, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? I would be lying if I said I was ready, but I am willing. <laughs> You're never truly ready. No. Three words to describe yourself. Oh, boy. Uh, shameless flesh peddler. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Uh, something ranged, obviously, because, you know, Huntress, but... Um, it's never my intent to kill or injure my prey. I just want to capture them. So maybe one of those things where you shoot it and it puts a net over to someone and they're not harmed. One of those. Nice. Yeah. Uh, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? The title be? A Momentary Diversion on the Road to the Grave. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? <laughs> Uh, I can't say I'm familiar with this game, so does does going first entail being the grabber or the grabby first? Um, I, we'd have to get clarification on the rules. Okay, uh, so assuming okay. that going first entails being the grabber, definitely I would prefer to go first. If you could have dinner with one celebrity, who would it be? Uh, I don't know if it, this counts as a celebrity, but definitely has more Twitter followers than I do. Uh, Zed Shaw... Probably. Uh, maybe Meredith Patterson. That would be a great dinner, Zed Shaw and Meredith Patterson. Enjoy Together. That. Nice. That's, that's good. Yeah, I'll, I'll allow you two celebrities to have dinner. Thank with. you. That's fine. <laughs> Excellent. Eve, thank you very much for appearing on the show. It was wonderful hey. to have you. 
Thank you. It's been great being here. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at a conference uh, sometime this year. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, any B-sides, I am likely to make an appearance. Uh, check out Circle City Con. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. It's been a pleasure. Cool. Excellent. Thanks, I, Steve. I will see you at uh, Nashville Eve, so see you in a month or so. Awesome, Jack. Look forward to raising a glass with you. Absolutely. Or, or 12. <laughs> yeah. Or 12. <laughs> or 12. We're going <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to take a short break, come back, and have a fabulous technical segment with the fabulous Allison Nixon. Thank you.